Hello everyone, welcome back to the Nightmare's Edge. Before we get started, I wanted to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Thank you for spending your evening with me. Now today I have a twisted little tale of a family Christmas feast. It's very delightful. This was actually written by my friend Old Gamers Never Die. He does have a YouTube gaming channel, so check him out. He will be listed in the description. The story was actually written and published under the name Robert Goforth. And amazingly, OGND has given me permission to narrate it. I would also like to thank the fantastic narrators who joined me in making this story come alive. Lady Nopingham. Danny Dreadful. Dark Little Voices. Shade and Decay. Cleaving Thought from Bone. And Somber Puppet. Their information will be located in the description as well. Check out each and every one of them. Definitely show them some love as I know you'll love their content. Now if you have a story you'd like to submit of your own, my email is also going to be listed in the description. Send it there. Now, sit back, relax, and let me tickle those inner fears. Saying that Harold Martin was a big man was like saying the Titanic was a big boat. Harold gave new meaning to the term massive, but it was a mistake to think that he had worked at building his formidable stature. One glance at his shaggy, tussled hair and his long, bushy beard told you right away that Harold didn't care much how he looked. Spending five minutes with a man, and you could tell that Harold didn't care much about anything. Anything, that is, except money. Money was exactly what was on Harold's mind that morning. It was 8.30 a.m. on December 24th, Christmas Eve. Any special significance of the holiday was entirely wasted on Harold. The fact that it was a holiday was all that mattered to him. Holidays earned him triple pay for every hour he could pull, and he had just finished 16. The best part was still ahead. He was looking forward to two more days of big money. This week's paycheck was going to be a killer. Maybe he would pick up that stereo he had seen down at the mall, the one with the speakers that were almost as big as he was. Man, that sure would get that dweeb in the apartment next door pissed. Harold smiled his crooked smile as he thought about that puny little Todd Herschel pounding on the wall, trying to make Harold stop, while he just turned up the tunes one more notch and gobbled down another Twinkie. As Harold rounded a turn in the winding country road that led home, his peaceful reverie shattered. The engine in his old pickup sputtered twice, wheezed painfully, and then shut off with a sharp, metallic clank. The final clank melted the grin off Harold's face and replaced with a visage of pure, unadulterated rage. Demons in the deepest, darkest sub-basement of hell would have gleefully done cartwheels into the lake of fire rather than face Harold as he climbed out of his truck. Ah, you giant pile of tick turd. Damn it, just what I need. You couldn't break down on a normal day. No, you had to break down on a fucking holiday. Harold began kicking the truck's side his steel-toed safety boots leaving large dents in the already rust-pitted body panels. All the while, a hot steam of profanity flowed from his mouth, making the air around him shimmer with its intensity. Finally, Harold got control of himself. His anger was no less severe, but he turned it inward to smolder and fume in the furnace of his chest. He began to walk down the road, looking for a house that he could find a phone. He'd call a cab, and when he got home, he'd call Jimmy Bird, he promised himself for the hundredth time that he'd get Birdman to tow that piece of crap down to the junkyard and put it in that car crusher thing he had. This time, he imagined himself pulling the switch, and that would free him forever from the truck's fickleness. It was cold. Snow had fallen three days ago, and still some clung to the shade-covered ground along the road. The weatherman had cheerfully predicted more snow was on the way, bringing a white Christmas again this year. To Harold, it just looked like the woods had a bad case of dandruff. By the time he reached the mailbox, the red Barlow, in childish scrawled letters, his breath was coming in great steaming puffs. He couldn't see the house, but a dirt driveway led into the woods. Somebody would be home. If they weren't, he'd just break a window, use the phone, and be gone before they got back. His crooked smile slid back onto his face as he made his way up the drive. The house at the end of the drive was old, and it appeared that the owner cared as little about its upkeep as Harold cared about his own. The white paint had faded to gray, and was peeling in more than a few places. 
One of the upstairs windows was boarded up, making Harold feel like it was winking at him as he approached. Weeds poked through the snow that still remained in the front yard. There was obviously someone at home. Must be a party, Harold thought as he stepped up to the front door and knocked. He barely rapped twice when the door swung open, revealing a short, very plump old woman drying her hands on her apron. She smiled warmly. Thomas, what in the world took you so long? Good gracious, you're near about frozen solid. Get on in here and warm yourself up. She grabbed Harold's arm and led him down the hall into a crowded living room. It was a big room, but the dozen or so adults and six or seven children that it already contained made the room look ready to burst at the seams. And it was so warm. Look who's here, everybody. The old woman said as she gently pushed Harold forward. It's Thomas. He finally decided to show up. Harold hadn't realized how cold he had gotten during his trek to the house. Now the fireplace drew him like a magnet. I, uh, I need to use your phone for a minute, but I'd like to warm myself up a little first. But my name's not Thomas. It's, it's Harold. Oh, Thomas, you're such a kidder. The old woman chuckled and turned back down the hall. The adults in the room went back to the conversations they were having when Harold came in. The children went back to playing their games. They each acknowledged Harold as he moved past them. But he was uncomfortable. He had never seen any of these people in his life. He was sure of it. Yet they all seemed to know him. At least they knew someone that must look an awful lot like him. Someone named Thomas. Even though he stood next to the fireplace, Harold felt an icy finger trickling down the back of his neck. I'd really appreciate it if I could use your phone. Harold said politely as he knew how. The last thing he needed was to get mobbed at the Walton family's Christmas special. Oh, now you just sit right down here and let me get you a cup of coffee. Was the response that he received. The young woman that had spoken quickly made room for Harold on the sofa next to her. She had shoulder-length auburn hair and sparkling emerald eyes that hypnotized Harold immediately. She stood up gracefully and said, I'll be right back. There's no hurry, is there? She winked at him, and he saw something in those eyes. Hunger. That's what he saw. He had seen it in countless X-rated videos that he had watched back in his lonely apartment. She wanted him. Just like the Platinum Princesses always wanted the man in those videos. Harold was no virgin, but it had been a long time since any woman wanted him at all. Never in his life had he dreamed that a woman that looked this good would want him with such animalistic intensity. Sure, there's no hurry. I got no place I need to be right now, anyway. Harold's reply was almost drowned out by the loud groaning of the sofa as he sat down. She moved down the hallway, towards the homey sounds of dishes rattling, pots clanging, and women gossiping. When she returned, she carried a steaming cup of black coffee and a plate of fried chicken. I thought you might be hungry. She explained as she sat down. Big boy like you needs to eat to keep up his strength. She giggled and placed a hand on his thigh, squeezing gently as she whispered tantalizingly into his ear. I bet you're big in all the right places, ain't ya? Harold almost choked on the coffee that he was swallowing. As he finished his coughing fit, one of the men that had been sitting across the room got up, stretched, and yawned loudly. Guess I'd better get out there and kill that turkey. That is, if we're planning on eating anything but Mama's cornbread for Christmas dinner. He commented as he strolled across the room. Can I help Uncle Jake? Asked one of the other children that had been playing on the floor. Nah, this is man's work. Your turn will come soon enough. Jake sauntered down the hallway, and Harold heard the back door open and slam shut. A brief draft of cold air accompanied the man's exit. Some of the icy tendrils penetrated as far as the living room, sending a fresh batch of chills up Harold's spine. He took a large gulp of coffee and settled in next to the red-headed bombshell to his right. He tried to make polite conversation with the family members in the room. At one time, he even read a story to the little girls that had been scampering in and out of the room with reckless abandon. He began to feel quite good about himself. Maybe he had finally found a place to belong. If they would just stop calling him Thomas. As they talked, he gradually became acquainted with the family. No one actually introduced themselves. They acted as if he was already supposed to know them. Harold had to pick up their names as they addressed each other. Angelina was the name of the green-eyed beauty next to Harold. All through the conversation, she was constantly running her hand up and down his thigh. 
It was driving him crazy. He could smell her scent, clean and fresh, with just a hint of perfume. It overpowered him as she leaned close and whispered to him again, Come on, Thomas. I've got something to show you. She grabbed his hand, stood up, and pulled him towards the living room door. He had just enough time to snag a chicken leg from the untouched plate before letting himself be dragged down the hallway, out into the kitchen. There they had met Grandma, the old woman that had greeted him at the door. I'm taking Thomas out back, Grandma. Angelina reported with only a hint of mischief in her voice. Harold supposed that he was the only one who noticed, because Grandma began shooing them towards the back door. You two have fun now. She called out the door behind them, much too loud to compensate for their close proximity. Harold figured that the old bat must be going deaf in her old age. As soon as the door closed, Angelina sprinted across the yard to a little wooden shed out back. Harold was just biting into the chicken when she reached the door and turned to face him. There was something strange about this piece of chicken, but before he could decide what it was, Angelina suddenly pulled open her blouse, revealing the milky white breast it had covered. Her nipples stood out profoundly in the frigid December air. She pursed her lips and made a kissing sound then giggled and disappeared into the shed. Harold stood for a moment, not believing what he had just seen. His heart hammered inside his chest as he tossed the chicken aside and bounded across the frozen ground towards the shed. This was truly the best day of his entire life. When Harold burst through the door of the shed, he was greeted with a sight that wouldn't quite register in his mind. Directly across the doorway was an open window. Standing on the other side of the window was Uncle Jake, and Uncle Jake was holding an incredibly large handgun, leveled right at Harold's head. To Harold, it seemed that he had just stuck his head into the cannon. Howdy, Tom. Glad you could come. Hope you don't mind staying for Christmas dinner. The family would just love to have you. Three things flashed through Harold's mind as he heard the gun go off. The first thing was the recollection of his own grandfather calling a male turkey a Tom. The second thing was Harold realizing that that chicken leg he had been eating had joints. Chicken legs don't have knuckles, you moron! That was a finger! A human finger! The third and final thought was he was allowed a message from his survival instinct. Its three-letter imperative was simple and to the point. RUN! Unfortunately, Harold's legs never got the message. The bullet struck his forehead dead center and his body was flung back out the shed to land on the frost-covered grass. It was 11.45 on Christmas morning when Sheriff Buddy Shears pulled up in front of Grandma Barlow's house. He was glad he had convinced the town council to purchase the Jeep last summer. Without its four-wheel drive, he would have never made it up into the driveway. A winter storm had moved in the previous afternoon, dumping over a foot of snow on the county. Big, heavy flakes still spattered the windshield, threatening to cover it completely, despite the constant slapping of the wipers. Buddy hated to bother old Miss Barlow, especially on Christmas Day. She was such a nice old lady. Seemed like she'd been living up here forever. From the look of the cars parked out front, he'd probably be interrupting the family's traditional Christmas dinner. His stomach growled angrily. He hadn't had time to eat any breakfast this morning. Buddy knocked three times on the door and was soon welcomed by Grandma Barlow. Well, Walter Shears, what in the world brings you out in weather like this? Come on in the house and get out of this mess. You'll catch your death. Buddy cringed at the mention of his given name, but stepped inside quickly. I'm sorry to bother you, Mrs. Marlowe. It being Christmas and all. But we've had a little trouble up the road. I thought you might be able to help us out. Well, I'll sure try. Come on in the dining room and have a seat. We were just getting ready to have Christmas dinner. I'll be glad to fix you a plate. There's more than plenty to go around. Thank you, but no, I really can't stay. His stomach rumbled in protest at these words. The aroma of the down-home cooking permeated the home, covering its normally musty odor like a warm blanket. I just need to ask you if you've seen a big fella come through here since yesterday afternoon. Name's Harold Martin. We found his truck up the road, but we couldn't find him. No, no, can't say I have, but then I was in the kitchen most of the day. Jake! Jake, have you seen any strangers around since yesterday? She hollered back over her shoulder. No, ma'am. Came a muffled reply from the dining room. But he could hear the clatter of silverware. He caught a whiff of country ham. Or was it baked chicken? More than likely, it was both. 
Grandma Barlow was famous for putting out a good spread at mealtime, and Christmas was a special occasion. His stomach growled once again. Well, I'm sorry to bother you all then. Damn fool probably broke down the storm and wandered off into Bailey Swamp. It won't be the first time some city boy went in there and never came out. Probably won't be the last. The old woman sighed. Now, you just wait right there. I've got something to give you before you go. Miss Barlow disappeared down the hallway before he could object. He was tired and impatient to get home. He had been up since 4 a.m. looking for Martin, and he wanted to get back to his wife and kids. The deputies could handle the search without him. He hated this Martin character for making him miss Christmas morning with his family. Just as Buddy was ready to slip out the door, making a quick getaway, Grandma Barlow came waddling back up the hall. She carried two large paper sacks. Holding up the one in her right hand, she said, This one's for Marcy and the kids. I know how much they like my peanut butter cookies. And this one's for you. You look like you can use it. Buddy took the bags and thanked the old woman. They exchanged goodbyes and Merry Christmases. Then he headed back out the door. Once in the Jeep, he opened the second bag and smiled. Maybe the morning was looking up after all. Inside the bag was a bottle of Coke and four chicken salad sandwiches. Grandma Barlow had always made the best chicken salad sandwiches that Buddy Shears had ever tasted. I hope you all enjoyed this evening's tale. I loved this story. Thank you again to Old Gamers Never Die for allowing me to read it, and to those who helped to bring it to life. All of their links, again, will be listed in the description. Show them some love. But that, my friends, will be it for now. Thank you so much for spending some time with me this evening. But until next time, remember, just because you couldn't see it, doesn't mean it wasn't watching you.